G'day guys, we finally got 10th edition in our hands and I thought what better way to celebrate than to get a bunch of local content creators on and make battle reports of the most epic scale that we can possibly muster. So what I'm presenting to you today is the first war of Armageddon told in a series of 10th edition battle reports. This video is just one amongst many in this epic battle report series. We're gonna break down the world eaters and the chaos forces used in the first war of Armageddon. We're gonna break down the Imperial Guard defense force. We're gonna break down the space wolves and the way that they intervened in this war. We're also gonna break down the gray knights. And then we're gonna tell a series of battle report conflicts. First, the world eaters smashing into the Imperial Guard. Then another battle report with the space wolves intervening and then fighting against demons. Then the Grey Knights coming on and combating the demons and slaying Angron, ending in a four-way battle report, talking about the aftermath of this battle and watching all of these factions go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, trying to clean up and seal the win for them. So make sure you check out each installment in this series. They will all be linked together in a playlist, but make sure you check them out. If you can, watch them in order to get the proper full viewing experience. I hope you enjoy them, and let's get stuck into this video. Alrighty guys, in this first installment we are going to be talking about the World Eaters forces and the Chaos Demons forces that were present in the first War of Armageddon. We're going to break down all of the models that are going to be used across these multiple epic apocalypse style battle reports. So let's get into it. Alrighty guys, let's go through this absolutely apocalyptic Chaos Force that's going to spill blood on Armageddon in the name of Korn. First up, we have our fearless leader, Angron. He's gonna be leading these world leaders into slaughter and he's gonna be doing absolutely massive amounts of carnage throughout this epic battle report series. And he's gonna be leading, let's just go left to right. We've got 100 corn berserkers, chain axes ready to go. We've got bolt pistols in there as well in case they're feeling like they're up for the firefight. We've got a whole bunch of different lords and characters among them. We've got Khan the Betrayer, Gorechild Whirling, he's ready to get stuck into the melee, and he is supported by an entourage of different characters here. We've got Masters of Executions, we've got Dark Apostles, we've got Chaos Lords, we've got Possessed Lords, we've got all kinds of crazy guys there ready to lead those Berserkers into the battle. Then, We've got eight, no shorter than eight, rhinos. And these are going to be used to deliver those corn berserkers into the thick of battle so that they can get stuck into their opponents and do as much carnage as corn berserkers were bred to do. We've got a vindicator in there for good measure so that we can blast that siege cannon and hopefully do some damage to the enemy vehicles and things of the like. Then, just in case the rhinos weren't enough transport capacity to get these blood-soaked maniacs across the tabletop, we have five Chaos Land Raiders. That's right, five Land Raiders ready to be launching various troops across the battlefield and also laying down firepower with their Soul Shatter Laz Cannons. That's going to be really exciting to see. But not all transport can happen from the ground. So we've got a bit of an aerial support element to the army today. So we've got two Charybdis Assault Claws. These are going to be dropping that Alpha Strike, delivering Berserkers into the heart, into the thick of the battle really early on in the piece. And then we have a Dreadclaw as well, Khan's personal Dreadclaw transport. He wants to be the first person to make planet fall in any conflict, and he wants to be the first one to spill blood on any world that the world leaders invade. So Khan has his own personal Dreadclaw drop pod. And then we also have two Storm Eagle transports. These are gonna be able to deliver those world leaders behind enemy lines, deliver them into the thick of the battle, and then, of course, it wouldn't be a planetary invasion of an Astartes-based army without a Thunderhawk. It's got that big volcano cannon on the top. 
It's going to be blasting you know, vehicles into pieces whilst laying down las cannon, heavy bolt of fire, and delivering just a plethora of blood-soaked maniacs into the thick of the battle. To support this aerial you know, uh, assault and make sure that enemy aircraft don't intervene too much, we have a couple of Helldrakes. They're going to be sort of running flanking missions and making sure that these crazy world eaters are able to get into the thick of the battle via the aerial superiority. Uh, we've got a few other interesting elements here. We go into our war machines. So we've got uh, a couple of Mauler fiends there. We've got a, a Blood Slaughterer and we have a Venom Crawler. This sort of little entourage of really close combat oriented demon engines is led by a Lord Discordant on Hellstalker. So he's customized these various demon engines to suit his needs and they roll around with him as a little nugget of just blood soaked demon infused metal that's going to be absolutely crazy on the tabletop and is something that strikes fear into the heart of these imperial citizens. Uh, but they're not the prize of his demonic engine collection. The prize of his collection are the three greater brass scorpions. So these are the pinnacle of world eaters infusion with demon and machine and it's gonna be an absolute bloodbath when these guys are running around with their big siege claws just ripping things apart whilst laying down firepower from their heavy cannons. Gonna be real cool there. We've got a fallen renegade chaos knight. He's there with his twin chain glaives and he's gonna be ripping things apart just doing absolutely crazy amounts of damage and proving that not all knights are noble in their, you know, in their desires. This guy's going in, he's looking for blood, he's looking for carnage, and he's looking to destroy as opposed to uphold his chivalric oaths of the loyalists. Uh, then we go into some more big demon engines, some really exciting guys here. We've got two Kaitans, or Lord of Skulls. So these guys, again, one of the prizes of that Lord Discordant's collection of demonically infused engines. These guys are laying down heavy firepower and they're also going in with the biggest chain axes that world leaders could imagine. They're gonna be really interesting on the tabletop. But to round out that demon engine collection, we have a few demonically infused decimators. So they're uh, the last little bits and pieces of the Lord Discordant's demonically infused Astartes based demon engines. And they've got their soul burner petards and they're gonna be ripping apart reality itself doing some seriously crazy stuff. We also have some more subtly, less intentionally designed demon-infused Astartes in the form of five Hellbrutes. Now these guys are a bit of a side effect of what happens when you piss off a world eater and strap him inside a machine and instead of letting him die with his honor, you tell him you must keep on slaughtering and the, the warp-infused chassis of that previously known as a Dreadnought, becomes a Hellbrute, and he goes in and just goes absolutely crazy. The fuse of you know, Demon Engine and Marine and Vehicle becomes an absolute maniac of fire frenzy on the tabletop. They're going to be really exciting. And then we have their more traditional Horus Heresy era counterparts in the Contemptor Dreadnoughts. Now these guys are a little bit less demonically infused and a little bit in less insane, However, they are still world eaters after all, so you've got to look out for them. They're going to be getting stuck in with their chain axes and uh, doing what world eaters do best. Their big brother is with them there. We have the Leviathan Dreadnought. He's got his butcher cannons and he's got another nice big chain axe as all world eaters like to do so. We've got a couple of the old box Dreadnoughts behind him there. We've got... Uh, these guys are a bit of a juggernaut infusion where they've basically, they've taken the concept of the Hellbrute and they've mixed it up with some different components to make some really exciting little demon engines there. Uh, to round out the armored component of this crazy World Eaters army, we have three Predators. Now they're gonna be laying down fire support. Their main purpose is to pop open vehicles so that the Berserkers can go in and rip the occupants apart and spill their blood. We don't want any armor getting in the way of bloodshed. So these vehicles are there to do that. And of course, at the center of this magnificent World Eaters army, we have the gigantic and dominating presence of a Reaver class Chaos Titan. He's got his big chain cannon. He's got his missile launchers. 
and then he's got a power fist capable of punching holes through siege walls. He's going to be doing massive amounts of damage, no doubt. And uh, his void shields should hopefully keep him alive long enough that he can bring those guns to bear. In front of them, we have some Chaos Spawn. Now, these guys, you'll notice, are a bit of a fusion between Berserker, 8 Bound, and Spawn. And basically, as you will know, the, uh, the 8 Cage is where Berserkers go if they want to be exalted into an 8 Bound position. However, should they fail the Trail of the 8 Cage, the Trials of the 8 Cage, they will become a Chaos Spawn. And that's what has happened to these unfortunate souls today. Then, in front of them, we've got some Bikers. Now, these guys are berserkers that really don't want to even have to deal with walking into battle. They don't want to have to sit in the back of a rhino on the way into battle. They want to get in there as fast as possible. So they've jumped on these bikes and they're flying up the table, ready to get stuck into that melee and do that damage early in the game. In front of them, we have 10 Red Butchers Terminators. Now these guys are the pinnacle of World Eater's sanity, as much as you can call it that where they're strapped into armor, they're protecting themselves, they don't just want to throw themselves away like a lot of World Eaters do. These guys want to live so that they can spend as long as possible claiming as many skulls as possible for their chosen deity. Then, in front of them, we have the exciting newest addition to the World Eaters Force. We have the 8-bound. So we've got three units there of six 8-bound. These guys are ones who have entered the 8-cage and have survived. They've come out with the demonic infusion and the power of eight blood letters surging through their veins. They're going in and they're doing essentially what a normal possessed would do, but world leaders style. But not only have we got those three units of six eight bound, we also have three units of three exalted eight bound. Now these are guys that have gone into the eight cage and not only survived, but they've actually achieved victory over those demons, which has given them an even stronger sense and a stronger sense of, you know, unity with those demons, and they're able to wield their power more effectively, making these guys absolutely terrifying monsters on the tabletop. Then we've got two units of 10 for a total of 20 Warp Talons. Now these guys are World Eaters with jetpacks strapped onto them, and they've foregone any pretense of ranged warfare for twin lightning claws, and they are just going in there they're not even trying to claim skulls. They just want to rip things apart. Their goal is to go in Wolverine style and just hack and slash and spill blood everywhere that they can with no intent of leaving anything left behind them except for a trail of blood. And they want to do it as fast as possible, hence the, uh, the jet packs there. And they also have a, a small amount of demonic infusion in them as well, just to make sure that they go in there properly blood soaked and properly thirsty for blood. Uh, what else have we got here? So now, the very last part of our mortals is we've got a few units of jackals down there. Their primary purpose is going around and collecting the skulls that have been spilled and claimed by the World Eaters. They're trying to earn their favor. They're trying to get themselves into the Astartes ranks. They're trying to get themselves demonic favor. And the way that they do that is they go around and they collect the skulls that have been claimed by the World Eaters. Then we've got a few units of your traditional Chaos Space Marine possessed. These guys are not quite the eight bound, but they are still world leaders and they are still possessed. So they're gonna be doing serious amounts of damage and spilling a lot of blood for corn. We go, uh, we got a dark apostle up there. We've got a few demonic heralds, some blood masters and the such, and they are leading the demonic component of today's army. So we've got, uh, I believe it's seven units of 10 blood letters over here. These guys are the battle line of the world leaders demonic attachment. So these guys are going in, they're killing, they're uh, tearing reality apart and emerging through these demonic rifts in the, in the warp and in reality. And they're basically going in there, they're claiming skulls and they're in competition, direct competition with the mortals. So even though they share the same goal, they're both racing to see who can achieve it faster. Is it something the mortals are gonna excel at or is this something that is better left for the direct demonic you know, manifestation of Korn's will. We've also got down here a whole bunch of flesh hounds. There's like 40 of them there. And these guys are the scouts. They're the front line of the demonic incursion. You'll know that the demonic incursion is about to get really insane when the flesh hounds arrive. And they're also Korn's dedicated hunters 
that will smell out enemy psychers. They're there to sift through the warp, find the enemy psychers, and that's where they strike because Korn hates that cowardry, cowardly wizardry. He's all about brute strength and honor in combat, and uh, the flesh hounds pinpoint their targets and make sure that the world leaders are able to come in full force and hunt down anybody using magic instead of using their honor and their will. Uh, we've got some demon princes in here. We've got some of these are uh, ex Astartes demon princes that have ascended to the ranks through deeds performed as a world eater. And then some of them are more demonic based. Perhaps they were previously jackals that have ascended into those ranks or other high ranking mortals that have become demon princes. However, they were non Astartes. So as you can see, they haven't got the, the power armor and the like, and they haven't got the wings. So they're not fully ascended to the same level. But nonetheless, they are going in and doing serious amounts of damage and spilling blood in favor of corn. Uh, then we have a cavalry component. Now, this is something that the, uh, the World Leaders forces use as a bit of a spear tip, particularly when they've got that heavy demonic incursion. And this is a bit of a hybrid between the, the World Leaders and the Demons, where we've got things like the Lord Invocatus, and we've got a few different corn Lords on Juggernauts. And this is sort of symbolizing the unity between the world leaders and their demonic allies, where their demonic allies have gifted the mount of a juggernaut to a mortal to symbolize the unity in these forces. And these Lord Invocatus and Chaos Lords on juggernauts are leading an armada of juggernaut mounted bloodletters, also known as blood crushers. And they're basically going in there again to stab, slash, hack their way through the enemy lines and charge in ramming speed, stamping their way through everything as a stampede of blood and gore. They are supported by a few skull cannons. Now this is a demon engine unit that has a cannon that fires piping hot skulls dripping in blood at the enemy. So as we claim their skulls and as those skulls are collected, they are fired back at you to not only do massive amounts of damage, but also destroy the enemy morale. When your best mate's skull has just been fired at you like a weapon, it's pretty hard to continue fighting and that's what these skull cannons are all about. They also have the juggernaut mount so they're going to be doing charges, they're going to be damaging things with their trampling feet and just generally being an absolute menace to deal with. We've also got three of the soul grinders. Now these are soul grinders dedicated to corn. This is where basically a bloodthirster gets banished to the warp and he's so impatient that he doesn't want to wait for his full form to rematerialize. So he basically makes a bargain with the Lord of the Forges and bargains to have his remaining manifestation bound to the carapace of a demon engine. So he's half demon engine, half bloodthirster, so that he can get back into the battle sooner than he otherwise would. And then should he claim enough skulls and build up enough power and favor, he will then get his full form back. So we've got three of those guys, really cool models. I love these guys, but I don't love them quite as much as a traditional Bloodthirster. You can't really because Bloodthirsters are one of the greatest models in the Warhammer 40k collection. And that's why I have nine of them in today's battle. So as you can see, we've got Scarbrand up the front here. He's the defamed Bloodthirster who was so crazily angry one day that he decided to actually take a shot at Corn himself. And uh, Korn was not too happy, as you could imagine, so he yeeted, uh, yeeted Scarbrand across the planet that they were on, across the demon world. Uh, Scarbrand did a bunch of laps of the planet, finally crashing, shredding his wings to pieces, and instead of allowing him to repair and, and re-manifest like a normal bloodthirster, Korn said, no, you need to wear those wings as a badge of shame, and you need to wear those scars, you are branded with them, and you will not manifest again until I say so. So he's in Korn's naughty books and he's here today to try to regain that honor by killing as many of these Imperials as he possibly can to show Korn that he is worthy of that spot at, at Korn's side. Uh, what else have we got here? We've got a whole bunch of Bloodthirsters. So we've got uh, nine in total. You'll see there's a, an array of different characters in here with different weapon loadouts. Each one of these is a leader of an entire army in his own right. However, for the purposes of invading Armageddon and getting the job done, they have decided to put their differences aside. They're going to follow Angron into battle and operate like his personal bodyguard, his personal entourage, and they are going to assist this favored 
member of Korn's legions and make sure that they're doing massive amounts of damage. These guys are going to come into massive handy positions in these battles when it comes down to taking those big targets. There's only so much you can do with a chain axe. However, with a great axe of corn, a demonic infused, imbued weapon, you can shred through tanks and those bigger targets like they are butter. Then we've got uh, Angrath himself. Now this is corn's biggest and strongest general. He's not necessarily the smartest or the best leader, but he is an absolute bully. And he is one of the ones that Korn sends in when he just needs the job done. He's a big bad guy on the tabletop and he does immense amounts of damage in favor of Korn. And it's going to be really exciting to see what he can do into the various armies we have arraigned in this battle report. Uh, and last but absolutely not least, we have Bellacor. Now, you might be thinking, why is Bellacor in a full Korn themed army? And because Bellacor himself is actually... A unmarked. He's dedicated to all four Chaos Gods simultaneously. However, that's a very difficult position to be in because you have four different bosses that you need to impress. And in this instance, Balakor has joined the battle because he's trying to remind Korn that he is worthy of Korn's favor and that he can assist Korn when Korn needs something done. And that's what's happening in today's battle is Korn has decided that there is something that desperately needs to be done and that is that Armageddon must fall. And uh, that's what we're here to do today. So that's the uh, totality of the world leaders and corn demons forces that are going to be engaging in battle on Armageddon. community suffers from some of the most prohibitively expensive essentials in the world, especially Australian content creators. Every single day, Dean wants to create content, but he can't. Suffering from old, worn-out brushes, expensive model kits, and costly software and equipment, he can't endure much longer. Just look at this dirty paint water. Would you drink this? Would you let your child? Even a small monthly donation can help provide Dean with clean paint water, basic tools for survival, and access to life-saving information and education. So please, follow the links in the description below and find out how you can sponsor Dean today and end the suffering. Suffering that is cruel, unsuspecting.